Hello, True Health Seekers, and welcome to another exciting episode of the Learn True Health podcast. I have now completed over 133 interviews, interviewing experts that are changing thousands of lives. I know we're making a difference. We have surpassed a million downloads, and uh, just today we had our largest uh, download day. We had well over 12,000 downloads in one day. Uh, It's growing and growing. If you look at the graph of uh, our analytics, you just see it's taking off, and that's because this information is helping people, and I know what we're doing is making a difference. Thank you so much for sharing the Learn Your Health podcast with your friends and with your loved ones. This interview sends chills up my spine. I realized when I stopped the interview today and uh, and finished the recording and, and thanked the interviewer and sat back in my chair that what I had just completed was the best interview I have done. And not because of me, but because of the guest. Today I have with you the most important interview I think I have ever done. I love every guest and I think every guest has so many important things to share. This interview is about saving humanity. And I know that sounds big, but it is is, is quite a powerful topic. Before we get into the interview, I wanted to let you know that today is my mother's birthday. Uh, the day I recorded this, May 18th, and like last year when I released an episode on her birthday, uh, I, I dedicated that episode to her and, and today as well. My mother passed away of cancer when I was 22 years old, back in 2002. Today she would have been 70. Having grown up, uh, my mother was my best friend and she was my mentor, she was my hero. And she's the one that inspired me to get into natural medicine and and believe in the body's ability to heal. Uh, Having to spend the majority of my 20s and 30s without a mom, uh, especially having been so close to her, uh, has been quite difficult. And so if you have your parents still, just give them an extra big hug today because you're very, very lucky. This episode I know she would have loved because the man I interviewed today is so passionately sh- spreading information that is making a difference in people's lives. He has documented people reversing their cancer, autism, behavioral issues, uh, emotional issues, uh, digestive issues, infertility, autoimmune disease, the list goes on and on. Reversing it naturally with this one very powerful change and that is exactly what I'm here to share with you today so this episode is dedicated to my mom thank you for bringing me into this world and thank you for raising me and showing me the power of natural medicine and so I could go on to help others through the Learn Your Health podcast Welcome to the Learn True Health Podcast. I'm your host, Ashley James. This is episode 133. Well, today we have a celebrity with us, so you will want to strap yourself down and pay attention to this one because what we're going to discuss by doing simple changes in your diet. And I know this sounds so cliche, just change your diet and you can heal. But truly, the science is here today with us. Jeffrey Smith, the director of a very uh, well-known movie. We're going to get into that. Uh, But before we do, know that by removing these things from your diet and just shifting slight things to remove these chemicals, these... these, um, you know, very harmful things that are hidden in our food. And Jeffrey's going to teach us how we can uh, detect them. Jeffrey has seen, and other scientists that I've spoken to have seen autism be reversed, major diseases be reversed, people healing symptoms that MDs couldn't understand why they had. So if you or someone you love is, it has a health concern 
And especially if you can't get on the other side of it with drugs or with a natural medicine that you've been attempting at the, to this point, this episode is the one you need to listen to. Jeffrey, I was so excited when, uh, when I found out that I would be interviewing you because your movie has impacted so many lives. And, uh, and now you're doing another movie, uh, your movie, Genetic Roulette, The Gamble of Our Lives, which is diving into what's going on with GMO truly. And I know that so many people go, oh, yes, I, I, I don't eat GMO. But GMO really has become more, um, more hidden uh, among our food, uh, and also uh, there's increasing levels of chemicals and new chemicals that are being introduced into our into our food supply without us knowing about it. And you're here to expose that. I'm so thrilled to have you on the show so that we can help people heal through this information. Welcome. Thank you. Thank you so much. Excellent. Well, I, I definitely want to talk about your your very powerful movie, Genetic Roulette. And I also want to talk about your upcoming very powerful movie, uh, Secret Ingredients, and all the work you're doing in uh, helping people to understand the dangers that are going on in our food. And really, uh, you and, and, your, and, and, and your team uh, are, are the whistleblowers that are, are helping us and saving us because it's a lot like back when there was lead in gasoline and people were being poisoned, you know, back when um, everyone was using an x-ray machine to to see if their shoes fit in the shoe stores, like back when we thought something was safe and then it, we or, uh, you know, you think of all these times in history when we think something is safe and it turns out it was harming so many people. We're at this point now where we think literally anything in the grocery store is safe to eat and yet there there's, there's hidden poison it's like would you go underneath your kitchen sink and drink the drink the bleach no but why are we eating just why are we trusting any food that is being sold and called food in a grocery store before we get into um everything you have to teach i'm really curious how did you get into this how did you get so excited about this information and dedicating your life to to helping people through exposing this information um, that you decided to uh, become a filmmaker? Well, I was a chronic do-gooder um, and looking for just ways of improving things that I saw were uh, problematic throughout my life. And I uh, was involved with um, marketing, communications, education, strategy. And in 1996, I went to a lecture by a scientist who was himself a genetic engineer, and he was quite alarmed. And the information that he gave was shocking, that a company called Monsanto, as well as others, were about to plant seeds throughout the Midwest using genetically engineered techniques, which this scientist absolutely knew from his intimate work with genetic engineering. He had won awards from the NIH. He was quite on the, on the cutting edge of genetic engineering. He knew that the technology was not safe and not predictable. In fact, the most common result of genetic engineering was surprise side effects. And we didn't even have the tools to evaluate all of the different impacts from the process of genetic engineering. Moreover, the foods that were about to be made available to the entire public were never tested properly for safety and never tested for most of the things that could go wrong. And this was going to be a potentially m monstrous health um, disaster, but even more so an environmental ca ca catastrophe because once you release these seeds, the plants would cross-pollinate, the seeds would blow in the wind, they'd get mixed up, and then we would be contaminating the gene pool without a way to decontaminate it. Once you release them into the environment, there is no recall it is irreversible, self-propagating contamination of the gene pool. So I was sitting in the audience listening to this and listening to a scientist describe in scientific terms what I was translating into words that were more impactful, because that's what I was doing, just realizing the implications and the stories and realize this scientist needs help. This topic needs help. We need to capture this information and get it to the right people, but we need to def des describe it in a way that actually carries the full weight of its risk and the, the folly 
of the rushing it into the marketplace before the science is ready. So I started interviewing that scientist and then other scientists, and I've been doing that for 21 years, translating the science into English. Uh, I ended up working at a GMO detection laboratory uh, where I was essentially paid to become more of an expert at the subject. And then I wrote the book Seeds of Deception. Now, as a strategist, I was trying to figure out how to stop the folly. And as you could, if I asked you, Ashley, what would you do to stop GMOs? You might mention, well, we need to do more research. What about getting the courts involved? What do we got getting legislation? We should talk to the, the president or a prime minister. Um, and we should maybe write a book, make do a movie. And I was thinking of all these different strategies, and I calculated what the strengths of the biotech industry were. They had basically control in Washington. They had tremendous control over the press, over academia, over farmers, and over scientists with a lot of money and influence. But what they didn't have was control over how people choose to eat. And that the process of genetic engineering and the things about it, we'll talk about that later, are so dangerous and the stories are so compelling and no one was talking about the health dangers. For some reason, all the nonprofits and activists were focused on the environmental issues and maybe the patenting and the concentration of power of the multinationals in agriculture, but no one was talking about the health dangers. And that to me was the Achilles heel. So I wrote the book Seeds of Deception, not only pointing out the health dangers, but also showing the corruption that allowed it to be on the market. For example, um, Michael Taylor was the person in charge of policy at the FDA, which said no safety studies are needed, no labeling is needed. Monsanto can just determine on its own that their foods are safe and put it on the market. Well, Michael Taylor was Monsanto's former attorney, later Monsanto's vice president, later still the U.S. food czar. And the, the justification for allowing the GMOs on the market was a sentence in his policy that said, the agency is not aware of any information showing that GMOs are significantly different. And that turned out to be a lie. Documents made public from a lawsuit years later showed that the overwhelming consensus among the scientists working at the FDA was exactly the opposite, that GMOs were different, dangerous, could lead to diseases and problems, and needed to be tested. So I, what I did is, as a communications strategist, I was extracting stories, stories of whistleblowers, stories of a scientist in Europe who was given $3 million by the UK government to figure out how to test for the safety of GMOs, he was a pro-GMO scientist and much to his surprise discovered that GMOs were dangerous and within 10 days caused massive damage to rats, potentially precancerous cell growth, smaller brains, livers, and testicles, partial atrophy of the liver, damaged immune system. And it was the process of genetic engineering, not the particular gene that he was inserting. Now, what I did with this, and this is a, a exemplary of how I worked, it's like there was a lot of details of the science that I understood, and I interviewed this, this scientist, Dr. Arpad Pustai, for hours and hours over weeks and months. But what I wanted to do was to capture the story. So I started the book Seeds of Deception, which became the world's best-selling book on GMOs immediately in 2003, and it's still the best-selling book translated in all these languages. I, just, I started the book where Arpad Pustai's wife answered the door and she found reporters standing in front of her, many other cars of reporters parking on her street and people running towards her. And she said, you know, we can't talk about what happened. We would be sued. It's okay, a reporter from Channel 4 said. You, they've released your husband. He can finally talk to us. And that's the, the kind of story that I bring the, the writer, the, listen, the reader into so they want to know why was he fired? Why, I mean, why was he fired? He was because I, I introduced him. He was fired from his job seven months ago. That he was gagged with the threats of a lawsuit, and now he could finally speak about what he knew about the dangers. And so I was doing it in the terms of of a communication strategy, which was far different than what the scientists were giving. The scientists were giving the technical information, but then I would ask them about their personal experience and and then weave the science into those stories, and that started the reframing the debate in the world on GMOs, where we realized actually they're dangerous and that there was collusion and corruption that allowed them to be approved and promoted. 
when I first heard about GMOs back in the 90s, I, I just, my <laughs> gut said something it does not seem right here. I mean, and I, I was young and naive, you know, I was, um, I was a teenager and, and still it didn't, it didn't sit well with me. Um, and then I started to watch, you know, the alt documentaries come in in the 2000s. And there was this one where it was like one of the first ones I ever saw about about that that kind of touched on GMOs and and um, how in Canada um, Monsanto was suing farmers that didn't pay them for their seeds, but that their um, crops were being pollinated by um, a neighboring farm. And so Monsanto would go around and sue uh, anyone who had their field contaminated with their with their genes, right? With their with their GMO um, corn, uh, which was just ridiculous. But the saddest thing is, is that um, Monsanto kept winning these cases, and these poor farmers were being put out of business. And then, and it just seemed like the very similar to the mafia you know, going into a neighborhood and saying, you have to pay us, um, to, to run your store. <laughs> you have to pay us. Absolutely. For, you have to pay us for protection against us. Absolutely. And, and then Monsanto's, Monsanto's, um, uses methods that are so, you use the word mafia. Um, that's a good analogy. They, there was a, a Percy Schmeisser is the most famous, uh, farmer who's actually, his case went up to the Canadian Supreme court. And they said it didn't matter how the, your contamination of your non-GMO canola happened. It could happen by, you know, seeds blowing off of passing trucks, which is what happened, and also uh, cross-pollination from neighboring fields, which happened. It didn't matter because it was Monsanto's intellectual property, and you harvested your products and replanted it, and that violated the law. Therefore, if you have any remaining canola, you must give it to Monsanto. So what he told me was that... Uh, Someone testified against him in court and lied about the fact that and, and you know claimed that he had purchased uh, Monsanto's seed and he never purchased Monsanto's seed. Then uh, he came up this this fella came up to Percy Schmeiser later and invited him over to his farm and then said, "See that those chemicals, which were Monsanto chemicals?" He said those were. I accept. He basically said he accepted a bribe of twenty thousand dollars worth of chemicals for lying about um, lying in the court. And he was, he was clearing his conscience because he had liver cancer and he died soon after. So this was one example. Then there's another book written by another far, about another farmer, and they would buzz his house. They would, um, with, a, with a plane, they, la they landed a helicopter over him. They, they would follow him around, taking pictures of him. They contacted all of his his customers, he was a seed cleaner, and said, if you continue to work with the seed cleaner, we will put you out of business. So he lost his business. He lost his retail shop. He ended up divorced. And he was just, uh, it was in a most incredible, systematic destruction of this person's life. And uh, eventually, he settled with a lawsuit, but he's not allowed to go into the details of the settlement, which Monsanto always does. So the the level of of Evil. I mean, Monsanto has been called, been voted the most evil company on the planet. I don't usually use that term, but it's used in these surveys. And I've talked to a former Monsanto scientist, and he said that three of his colleagues were doing safety studies on the milk from cows that were injected with Monsanto's bovine growth hormone. And they found in the milk so much cancer-promoting hormone called IGF-1 that the three Monsanto scientists refused to drink milk thereafter unless it was organic, one bought his own cow. This, <laughs> I know. And, and the thing is, they're still selling this stuff. I mean, actually, they sold it to Eli Lilly. So now they're selling it. And so the same scientist from Monsanto, former, said that they also found that rats were damaged when they fed, when Monsanto fed them their corn. And instead of withdrawing the corn, they rewrote the study to hide the effects. And the scientist said, now, the amount of corn that was fed to these rats was rather small. I think it's 33% is the most that they normally do in one of their studies. But he was saying in Southern Africa, corn is a staple and it could be 70% of someone's diet. And so if the rats developed serious problems in 90 days, what would happen if someone's eating it all of their lives and it's 70% of their diet three times a day? I will share a story in a few minutes about farm workers who were eating 
genetically modified corn, 100% genetically modified corn every day, and what happened to them? It was it's absolutely it's like they're the canaries in the coal mine, eating more GMOs than anyone on the planet, and what happened to them was horrific. Unbelievable. Let's just um, for a minute. Let's go back to the cow, the the cows, and and, and so this this milk. So if it's not organic, it, there's there's a potential. If we, I just went to the store right now. And bought non-organic milk, so like just conventional conventional milk. Is there um, a potential that it would have that cancer-promoting hormone in it right now? Yes. Now, uh, Canada did not approve the use of bovine growth hormone. But if so I'm, in the, can, I'm in the states, so so, so right. which, oh, and I do have listeners around the world. So right, right. You, know, you go, we it's got not, to check with with our each country. But but exactly, for, for those in it's the not states. approved. It's not approved in Europe. It's mm -hmm. not approved. It's not approved in most places. But in the United States, most dairies have banned it, but will say it on the carton, and they'll say it in one of three ways. They'll say no RBST or no RBGH or no artificial hormones. If it doesn't say those things. You might check the website to see if it says it there, and you can actually go on their website and do a search under artificial hormones and see if they have a statement. But if it doesn't, then you may want to throw the milk out. What happens is you it's bovine growth hormone. It's injected into cows. It revs up their, their metabolic system. It's called crack for cows. It causes huge damage in the health and lifespan of the cows. And they're, in the milk, there's more growth hormone, there's more IGF-1, which is linked to cancer because it promotes cell growth, cell replication, and there is more pus, and there's more antibiotic-resistant bacteria because they use more antibiotics on the animals when they feed them, when they inject these um, bovine growth hormone. I have a, a, an 18-minute film called Your Milk on Drugs, Just Say No, and you can go on to yourmilkondrugs.com It'll bring you right to the page on our website, and you can watch the 18-minute film. And I borrowed heavily from a Fox News report. They were going to do an air a four-part news series, blowing the whistle on bovine growth hormone, linking it to cancer, and ex exposing that it was being used in Florida. This was a Florida-based Fox station. And they advertised about it, and just before it was to air, the 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 station got a threatening letter from Monsanto's attorney. So they they canceled, they postponed the uh, showing, they vetted the script, everything was found to be accurately reported. The person who was in charge of the station was in himself a former um, investigative reporter. And so it passed muster, they rescheduled it for a week later. Then another threatening letter from Monsanto's attorney went to Fox Central and promised, quote, dire consequences to Rupert Murdoch and his businesses. Now, the Rupert Murdoch had an advertising agency where Monsanto was a, um, was a client, and also the station itself had advertisers, food companies, which had products from animals injected with bovine growth hormone. So they were looking at a loss of revenue from advertising as well as other companies. And so they fired the station manager. They couldn't fire the two reporters who were under contract. And so they asked, according to Steve Wilson, one of the two reporters, they offered him uh, like $250,000 for hush money saying, we'll give you the rest of your your um, contract. You can just walk away as long as you promise never to speak about this again. He refused. And so what happened was the the lawyer for Fox Central was in charge of the rewrites, the redrafting of the script to make it easier and easier and easier and less threatening. And her whole her whole criteria was what could be broadcast that would not that would allow them to dismiss a lawsuit in summary judgment. It had nothing to do with what was true or not true. And they brought these these reporters through 81 rewrites over months. And as soon as the contract expired, and they may they may never have intended to even run it in the first place, but as soon as their contract expired, they they fired them. And then the the um, 
the reporters sued Fox and were awarded, one of them was awarded $400,000 from a jury because they say that she was um, fired because she threatened to blow the whistle on the fact that uh, Fox was illegally lying on television. Fox appealed and won the appeal because according to the Florida whistleblower laws, it's not illegal to lie on television. So what? the whistle. <laughs> <laughs> so it's, it's not illegal to be fake news is what is what. Exactly. <laughs> so um, so here's the point. The point is that that. They have they have tremendous power in the courts. They have tremendous money. It's this nonstop um, flow of attack, and so they actually have these these reporters pay part of their legal fees. So they ended up losing, uh, and but. Um, and I've got to, to know uh, both of them, the one of them in particular, and interviewed her and found and I was sent the only existing public available version of this eight of this four part news series, uh, which I then cut into this 18 minute thing, which I then narrated and helped just uh, put it into context because it was several years ago. And so that people can watch on your milk on drugs dot com. And uh, hopefully you will never have milk from cows treated with bovine growth hormone again or or yogurt or cheese or right. whatnot. I, I was going to say, uh, you know, you could buy bread and there's, you know, if they put milk in the bread or or pastries or, or you know, um, there's milk is in. So I, I'm dairy free. And so I know milk is in a lot of right. things because I have to be a food detective. It drives my husband nuts. He's like, do, we, do you really have to be an in ingredient reader today? Like when we're going through the grocery store, if I normally we shop the perimeter of the store because at least we know it's safe it's a, if it's a single ingredient look there's broccoli we know what's in it it's broccoli right. it's organic okay it's good but when i you know venture in, into the aisles of the grocery store now it now the fun begins because i have to pick up literally every single thing and read every single ingredient and, uh, and to make sure, <laughs> I mean, it, I got, I got this image of you, Ashley saying, cover me, I'm going in <laughs> and everyone forming little, little guards around each thing's holding their, their, uh, their scanners ready to scan and, and figure out what's going on in, right. each, in each ingredient. Exactly, so yeah, exactly. And so, so dairy's in a lot of things. And so we could think that we're not, um, consuming, um, this type of dairy, which is uh, cancer causing, but yeah, it but could be hidden in a lot of foods. In addition, the cows may be fed genetically engineered feed. And if it doesn't say organic or non-GMO project verified, then that's another risk for dairy. And, and eating, that, eating at restaurants, you know, I mean, we could be, and, and for me, I'm, I eat so clean at home, but you know, sometimes I just get sick of cooking and I want to go out and there's very few organic restaurants. And so often we'll go somewhere where it's sort of clean. So I could sort of, you know, eat healthy. Obviously I'm, um, gluten-free, dairy-free, so that limits it. But um, if someone goes to a restaurant and they order the lasagna or whatever, I mean, there's no way of knowing that. And, and likely that restaurant isn't ordering dairy that costs them more because a restaurant's job is to make a profit. And so they're going to order the cheapest possible ingredients and and the cheapest possible ingredients are going to be subsidized and they're going to have um, GMO and they're going to have the, the these hormones that increase cancer. So so what what do we do? Well, I will give people a lot of things they can do going out to eat what they buy and all that stuff. But let me give you some more motivation first. <laughs> I love it. I love it. Yeah, because we... the thing is, it's like it's like it's like if I start describing all the things that you need to do now before you realize the real dangers of what we're talking about, and I haven't even started, um, it's going to be like, um, yeah, I'm going to die anyway, so I'm not going to bother. But I will tell you what you're about to hear is going to be much more motivating and they'll pay a lot more attention to the instructions <laughs> if we do it that way. Now, I told you in a few minutes I would talk about what happened in South Africa. I think I'll yes. start with that and then I'll talk about what's happening in the United States with with people who aren't eating 70% of their diet is genetically modified corn. So I was talking to a veterinarian, um, interviewing him actually for a film, uh, and uh, he said to me that a South African farmer approached him and had real problems with his dairy cows and his pigs. He was losing money. The, there were 
there was a lot of sickness, low um, milk production. Um, the animals, the pigs, were sometimes cannibalistic and violent. And also they had sort of almost Alzheimer's type symptoms where they'd wander around dazed. And he didn't know what to do. And the guy gave him all these different instructions. And he said, look, if there's one, tell me one thing I could do. And he said, okay, don't feed your animals GMOs ever again. So he grew a bunch of non-GMO corn and fed his pigs and cows. And the problems went away. He started making money. Everything turned around. And the only thing he did was to feed the non-GMO corn instead of the GMO corn. Then he ran out because he didn't have enough for a year-round feeding. And then he had to buy corn from the marketplace, which was a mix of GMO and non-GMO, and the problems came back for the animals until he was able to grow enough for year-round feeding, and then the problems went away. In the meantime, he had a need for 50 farm workers on his farm, but they were so sick that he had to get, hire 20% more, 60, in, because so many were down with sickness, headaches, flu-like symptoms, inflammation, and that he said, once or twice a month, he would be speaking to one of his workers, and he would notice that the eyes would not track correctly. They wouldn't be in parallel anymore, and he knew within one to two days that worker would be dead. <gasps> and, and he could not figure out what was going on. And when he switched to, buy, to, to growing the non-GMO corn, the problems with the workers went away. They were eating the corn. And when he had to buy the corn from the marketplace because he ran out, the problems came back until he was 100% non-GMO again. Did he, with know, the work did he know they were eating the feed? Well, the thing is they were growing corn both for the workers and for the uh. – everyone Everyone in, in South Africa knows about white corn. It's it's mealy. It's, it's, it's a very specific uh, staple. It's like rice in Asia. It's corn in South Africa. So um, the situation – there was absolutely dire. Now, they eat huge amounts of corn. What about in the United States? Well, I've been, I was representing, getting back to my, my background, because I'll lead into how I discovered more of the dangers. I was, I was reporting on the dangers, traveling around the world. Um, I was at 25 countries at that point, and I realized I was handing my book, Seeds of Deception, which was stories to cabinet ministers, to members of parliament, to senators, and they were going, oh, thank you, would you sign it? They'd hand it to their their uh, intern or their assistant, and they'd probably never see it again. And I realized these people have very little time. But I was able to win every debate and every argument with a GMO scientist because I knew the science and I knew that they did not have science on their side. They had myths and lies and a lot of money. And I realized we needed to convey, again, how to convey information effectively. I figured I need to get information that for, for left brain evaluators, not just those that read the stories. And so I wrote another book called Genetic Roulette, The Documented Health Risks of Genetically Engineered Foods. But I wrote it in such a way where it was a two-page spread. The left side was a statement which gave all the information you needed for that two-page spread, plus some bullet points under it and a, clo a quote from the scientist. So a lot of white space, that was for the attention deficit politician. <laughs> <laughs> And then if you look at the right side, there's the full write-up and there's the, the end notes that go back to the 1,153 end notes in the book. So, so I was compiling all the known health risks of GMOs into one volume, big, eight, you know, eight by 10 or nine by 12 volume that looked like a textbook and but was really easy to read. And as I was compiling it and speaking about it, I was representing scientists. And I don't know if you know scientists, but I'll make fun of them here. I love them, but I'll make fun of them. You know, they might say, converging lines of evidence suggest that I might be chilly. They don't say anything definite. They don't like say, this causes this. They're always qualifying their statements. And because I was representing them, I too qualify my statements and don't overstate. 
But I was also starting in 1996 to, as the book was almost ready, to speak to medical conferences. And I've been doing that year after year. And the doctors started prescribing non-GMO diets. In fact, the American Academy of Environmental Medicine did their own evaluation of GMOs and said every doctor should prescribe non-GMO diets. There's reproductive problems, organ damage, accelerated aging, digestive issues, um, and all sorts of problems in the animal feeding studies showing causality. And so after speaking at this conference year after year, I went finally with a video camera and started interviewing the doctors, and I was shocked. Because the doctors don't speak like scientists. They speak from their own experience, and they were telling me one after the other after the other, GMOs cause inflammation. GMOs cause my allergic patients to have more allergies. One woman said, I put everyone in a non-GMO diet, and they all get better. Oh. I was skeptical. <laughs> and so I, I had been for years hearing people saying, I can tell when I eat a GMO, and I did not believe mm -hmm. them. Mm -hmm. I thought it was some background trend that would be hard to pick up. And when these doctors, this one doctor said, everyone gets better. I still was skeptical. I said, what percentage? She said, I said, everyone, 100%. Okay, 98%. I said, how many people did have you put on a non-GMO diet? She took some time and actually calculated it and then turned, looked up and said, about 5,000. So I said, I want to go to your clinic and interview your patients, which I did. But I also realized that the scientists that I talk about and talk, talk to, they never did experiments with 5,000 rats or mice. The number of experiments that this one doctor did on her patients was more than any of the, sub, the, the combined subjects of all the research done in animal feeding studies in, in carefully controlled environments. But here we had thousands of doctors now prescribing non-GMO diets, and they're telling me people are getting better. So I went to her office, I went to other offices, and I started hearing reports from people of dramatic recoveries that sometimes happened in a day or three days or or three weeks or six weeks, depending on the malady. And she even told me, yeah, if it's anxiety or depression, it can go up immediately, it can clear up immediately. If it's allergies or immune system, maybe three to seven days. Digestive problems can take a bit longer. And she was describing this, this improvement based on experience of 5,000. And then I, I was thinking, well, she actually prescribes more than just non-GMO. She gets people on non-processed foods. She gets people on organic. And she may, depending on an intake form, prescribe gluten-free or dairy-free. There were others that had much less protocols who were also seeing improvements. But it's hard to tell because GMOs are not labeled in the United States. And so everyone has to create some kind of strategy, which would involve other potential confounding factors that could also be leading to these results. But at the same time I was interviewing her, I was interviewing farmers who took their pigs and cows onto non-GMO feed, and they were getting the same results. And there weren't gluten-free pigs, there weren't dairy-free <laughs> there weren't dairy-free cows. And and they were getting there were more energy, they had health, more health, their digestive problems, no more diarrhea, no more birth defects, higher litter size, higher conception rate. Uh, less 75% less use of medicines in one pig farm, 69% less use of antibiotics in another pig farm. So these animals were getting better and their behavior was changing sometimes within two days. Instead of being sickly and lying down all the time, they acted like piglets again. And these, and I've heard these, and every farmer I spoke to said used the same technical term when describing the changes in their animals soon after they switched to non-GMO. They always used the word happier. Wow. <laughs> so. So I started then in 2012 after Genetic Roulette came out, the movie, and so many people by the millions were changing their diets to non-GMO. I started being uh, deluged by stories. And I, and I started asking people in the audience, what have you noticed when you switched to non-GMO? And the stories were compelling. So I'm going to give you, share some stories, and then I'm going to give you some of the science as to why we can trust these stories. Mm -hmm. So people would say to me, okay, I've got problems with acid reflux or inflammatory bowel or irritable bowel or constipation. And I'd raise this, okay, raise your hand if you've had gastrointestinal problems. Always the number one category, gastrointestinal. Then people would say, oh, reduced brain fog or increased energy. I said, how many people had increased energy or reduced brain fog? Always the number two. Then there was always a, a bunch of people that said, uh, weight, easier to lose weight, um, anxiety and depression, um, uh, it, all sorts of immune system problems like allergies, 
all sorts of skin problems, headaches, pains of all types, joint pain, musculoskeletal pain, um, fibromyalgia. And I was also hearing stories uh, that were a little less frequent about autism, diabetes, blood sugar, fatty liver, even restless leg syndrome. And people were reporting all these things, but there was definitely the most popular and then a mid-level and then the less popular. But it was consistent. In 150 lectures that I've given or more, it's the same level. And then I did a survey with 3,600 people about which symptoms improved when they switched to a non-GMO diet. And it was the same symptoms in the same relative frequency. And I've heard some stories, especially around children, a lot about their behavior, where one woman said, my six and a half year old was violent and out of control. They wanted to kick him out of school. I saw your film, changed his diet, all the problems went away. I said, how long did it take? She said, one week. And then, if that, then she paused and said, within a month, I had a new son. Oh my gosh. I had someone work for me uh, as a volunteer at a booth at a conference I was speaking at in, in, in California. She said <clears throat> she saw the film Genetic Roulette, The Gamble of Our Lives, and was immediately thought of her grandson, who was always acting out in school. They were calling home every day about his behavior, and he also had trouble breathing. So she said to her son, and this is, talk about a salesmanship here, she said, if there's anything that you do in this life, simply because I ask you to do it, watch this film. <laughs> I have never used that tactic, but she did. And she got her son to watch the film and he said, okay, we're changing his diet. And the entire problem went away. He, no more problem breathing. And she says the school never calls home except the day after he eats in the other grandparents' house because they're not yet on board. And so for this kid, it was the day after. It was an immediate response. And at many of the doctors I speak with at these medical conferences and otherwise, they say when they've switched someone to non-GMO and they see all these dramatic recoveries, sometimes there's backsliding. And for some, it's a single meal. And for some, it's a weekend. And some, it's a, vac it's a vacation's worth of meals. But the person will start noticing the symptoms and that becomes their enforcement for maintaining that um, healthier diet and lifestyle from then on. I hope you're enjoying this interview so far. We'll get back to it in a minute, but first, I wanted to share a message that has been on my mind to bring to you. You know, I started this journey because I wanted not only to help you experience amazing health, but I wanted to find it myself. And what better way to find something than to learn from experts and also to teach it. Through this last year of doing the holistic podcast known as Learn True Health, I have had the honor of connecting with over a hundred experts in the field of natural medicine. One thing that's really inspired me is there's a group of people, in fact, it's the fastest growing career field in the United States right now, and that is health coaches. I didn't really appreciate them or understand what their role was until after I started interviewing enough of them. And I found that health coaches have an amazing ability to impact someone's life far beyond what medical doctors are doing right now. You see, you might see your medical doctor once you're already sick, right? The old paradigm of healthcare is to go to a doctor when you're sick, uh, wait till your body breaks down or show signs of symptoms, and then you need a doctor's intervention. Not many people, now maybe you do because you're smart and because you're a Learn Your Health listener, you probably do this to some extent, go to a doctor on a regular basis and, and get great health advice from them. Do you go to your doctor and, he, and they t say, hey, you know, I noticed that uh, you could really use more vitamin C and, and I think you should eat this. And, and I really think that uh, based on your body weight and based on your, your blood work, that um, a, a few more minutes of cardiovascular exercise And here, why don't I go ahead and show you how to do it? Why don't I go ahead and, oh, I've got some recipes that are really going to help you because I see in your blood work that you could really benefit from these nutrients. Why don't I go ahead and spend an hour with you and help you do that so we can get you on the right track? No, no medical doctor does that. And if they do, God, hold on to them and definitely tell, tell everyone about them. I don't know any medical doctor that has the ability to sit down with you on a regular basis and not only find out about your, your lab work, 
but also find out about your 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 health in every aspect of your life. You see, if you have a really, really stressful job and you have no outlet for that, that can bleed into other areas of your life and, and lead to ill health, right? So what I'm learning about health coaches is that they help their clients to gain balance and holistic health in every area of their life. They come to you wherever you are, whether you're still eating McDonald's and you're 400 pounds and you're sitting on the couch, whether you're uh, driving a truck and and you just don't have time for exercise and you you really do want to eat healthy, but you're always like 100 miles away from any whole foods or whether you're you know, already gluten-free and already eating organic, and you could just really use some extra advice to take your health to the next level. Wherever you are, a health coach meets you where you are. And then what they do is they slowly add step-by-step the most powerful but, but manageable changes slowly that make the biggest difference in your life. And they, they help you to find out what it is that you need most that's going to make the biggest difference in your life. And so the more I learn about health coaches, the more I realize that we need more health coaches in the United States, in Canada, in Europe, in Asia, in Australia. We need more uh, help, this kind of help where someone can be our health advocate, where they can hold our hand, where they can take the time to slowly teach us the things that we wish our parents and our grandparents had taught us, We that the things that we wish we had learned in high school, the things that should be taught in home ec, right? And unfortunately aren't. The things, the lessons that we want to learn so that we can pass these lessons on and these healthy habits on to our children and uh, to our future generations. Now is the tipping point. You may have heard the scary statistic that our children's generation now has a slower, a smaller life expectancy than we do. Can you imagine if if we're meant to live to be, for example, 75 years old, our, our children might only live to be 68. This is very scary. The fact that diabetes and prediabetes, one in three people have blood sugar issues. The scary statistic that one in two men in their lifetime will experience cancer. One in three women in their lifetime now will experience cancer. These are, these are statistics that need to be stopped and only you can do that. So, you know, if you're the type of person that knows that you could benefit from it, I highly recommend checking out a health coach. Now I am actually in a health coaching program, becoming a certified health coach. And in six months I will be a certified health coach. And I am absolutely loving this program. I'm halfway through the program and I'm, I'm sending this message to you, not only for those who want to make changes in their life, but I know there's a listener out there who is looking for a new career, who's looking to shift their life. Now, the Institute for Integrative Nutrition was started over 25 years ago by Joshua Rosenthal. You can go back and listen to my interview with Joshua Rosenthal, which I mean, he is my hero. He's absolutely amazing. I I recommend listening to his interview. He started this actually for women. Now he has men in his course in, and, you know, I love seeing and hearing that men are getting into the health coaching field, but Joshua actually started the Institute for Integrative Nutrition for women because he saw that there was an imbalance in the workforce that women, um, had less opportunities 25 years ago to be able to live their passion and be mothers and maybe work from home. And as a health coach, you can do that. You can still be a mom. You can still have a career. You can still be a full-time mom. You can still homeschool. Whatever you want to do, you can fit health coaching into your life, however you see fit. It's amazing. Um, What I also love about Institute for Integrative Nutrition is that they also have a business courses. So not only are you learning how to be an exceptional health coach, but you're also learning how to hit the ground running however you want, whether you want to do full-time or part-time, whether you want to take on one client a week, a month, whether you want a hundred clients, they teach you how to structure your business, how to market yourself in a way that comes from your heart, comes from authenticity, comes from integrity. I have never been more inspired by an institute in my life. So for the listener out there that has been seeking, that has been looking for their life purpose, that 
when they think about the possibility of helping someone, of helping people, they get teary-eyed. You know, every time I think about people who are hurting, that I, I that I could I could impact their life, that I could help them, I just start crying. Uh, tears of joy and inspiration. I want to help people. And so if you, like me, are, are inspired by helping people and you really are passionate, you don't have to know anything. You don't have to know anything about health. Um, you don't have to be an expert. That's fine. You, you don't have to have a degree. You can start as a student with the Institute for Integrative Nutrition and they'll teach you everything you need. And you can do it in your spare time, do the course in your spare time while you're a full-time mom or while you're working full-time or whether maybe you're still a student. It, I love how they, they really organize and they spent years. I mean, they've been teaching it for 25 years. They've been, they've organized the material. It's all online. So you can be anywhere in the world. There's students all around the world. So if, if, if you're the listener that I'm talking to about wanting to shift your career, or add to your career, maybe you're already in the health field, you just want to increase your knowledge, or maybe you just have a calling and you want to try it out, please check out the Institute for Integrative Nutrition. Go to their website. It's IIN, Institute for Integrative Nutrition. Check them out. Give them a call and ask for, you can get a, a download to their, their course, their curriculum. You can even do one of their classes for free to check it out to see if it's, it's a match for you. When you go to enroll, mention you heard it from me, Ashley James, Learn Your Health Podcast, because I have aligned myself with them to make sure that you get a special. I want to I want to hook you up. Any of my listeners who go through their program get a special from the Institute for Integrative Nutrition. And also, I want you to tell me. I want you to email me ashley at learntruehealth.com. Join our Facebook group, you know, just search Learn True Health in Facebook, join our group. I want you to contact me and tell me you're going through the program. I want to support you in your success. Uh, if you have any questions or you just want to tell me how amazing it is, I have some great listeners that have already gone th- or have begun going through their program and they all love it. And I just, I love uh, creating this community. So if this is something you think would be interesting to you, even if anything I've mentioned is remotely interesting, if you go to learntruehealth.com on the sidebar, you'll see um, halfway down, just scroll halfway down, you'll see that there's uh, in the widget section a place where you can click to uh, get more information about, about the Institute for Integrative Nutrition or just go to their website. Their website was so impressed me because you see all of the teachers that teach their course and uh, you begin to recognize their names and you, and you realize that these are all sort of heroes in the holistic health field and you can't believe that you're going to be learning from them. Um, it's been a dream come true, come true. And and I actually, I've had some of their teachers on the show already, and I'm going to have more. I've, I've, I've scheduled some to be on the show in the future. So thank you so much for taking the time to listen to my message. Uh, I wanted to take the time to give you this information because I know that there are some listeners out there that are looking for this change now. And they're looking to shift their career to help people to that they genuinely want to make a difference. We want to shift the message from the old paradigm of wait till you get sick and then go to a doctor and get a pill to shifting our lifestyle. So we're living, we're living the most authentic, healthy lifestyle possible so that we can have a, a life that is vibrant, that is full of energy. We can have health freedom right? Don't we want to wake up feeling like we're 18 years old every day, no matter what? And we can have that. So if you want to have that for yourself, get a health coach, definitely get an IAN health coach. If you want to learn how to do that so you can do it for yourself and help others, definitely check out taking the Institute for Integrative Nutrition's health coaching program. It's a certification program. I highly recommend it. If you have any questions, absolutely feel free to email me. Excellent. Well, enjoy the rest of this interview. That's amazing. Now I have to, I have to sort of uh, get clear on something. When something is GMO, it also, what comes with it it, are pesticides and herbicides and all the, all sort of the, 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 the slew of chemicals that the farmer used, right? 
let me, this is a perfect, this is exactly the question. What's a GMO and why could it be causing these problems and what else is added to it? So genetic engineering is where in a laboratory you, you either insert foreign genes into the DNA of a crop for a particular purpose, or you rearrange the genes within the DNA. Now, the process of genetic engineering, irrespective of what gene you put in, the process causes massive collateral damage in the DNA. You can change the levels of gene expression of up to 5% of the functioning genes. That could be hundreds of genes. In fact, just this year or, or last year, they found that in Monsanto's one corn variety, that there were over 100 different proteins and metabolites that were different in the genetically engineered variety compared to the natural variety of the same type. And two compounds, now check out the names of these compounds that were increased in this Monsanto corn, putrescine and cadaverine. Oh. <laughs> and yes, you have guessed it, they are responsible for the foul odor of rotting dead bodies. So not only is that in higher levels of this corn, but it's also linked to increased allergic reactions and cancer. So that's part of the background noise. Another of Monsanto's corn has a new allergen because the gene is normally silent, was switched on, it produces a known allergen. Uh, their soy has up to seven times the amount of an existing allergen. It also has a metabolic pathway that's open that might link to Parkinson's disease. So all of that's the background noise of the process of genetic engineering, irrespective of why, of why you genetically engineer. Okay, let me stop you right there. So, so to, to clarify, if I eat, uh, G G GMO food, um, uh, separate from the fact that there is also Roundup, you know, glyphosate and other 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 chemicals used, so that there's other chemicals in that food. So just a GMO itself, which you know, you cannot isolate the two because they're always grown with chemicals. But if I were to eat a GMO, and, and so I'm eating uh, this man-made um, DNA RNA, you know, man-made whatever it's Mash, called, right? Mashup. Um, Let's call genetic. it a mashup. <laughs> okay, I'm, 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 I'm consuming man-made genetics, man, yes. man playing God, and I eat it and my body breaks it down and now there's all these um, new proteins that my body's not used to. Um, does it, The question is, because um, our, our genes are, are largely um, not active. There's so many... Um, there's so many genes that aren't expressing, right? And, mm -hmm. and and so part of epigenetics is that we our body can turn on and off genetic expressions, meaning we could have dormant cancer cancer causing genes dormant in the body, or we can have dormant Parkinson's, for example. And and if I'm consuming um GMO, so I'm consuming these these uh genes that were um, designed in order to express a new something new within so so like I've heard that genetically modified lettuce for example would be because they want to make the, they could actually turn on a gene to make the lettuce look greener because we can in the grocery store we go oh look that's greener lettuce therefore it must be healthier no they or, or tomatoes you know I know they were doing tomatoes to with a with a salmon gene so that the tomatoes wouldn't freeze right so they're you're you're you're, you're either turning on or you're amplifying an an expression of a gene um, or you're you're completely modifying it but basically like this Frankenstein experiment if we consume it does it interrupt our genetic makeup are we messing up with our uh, gene expressions if we were to consume GMO foods well definitely because when we when we eat foods it has an epigenetic, epigenetic effect and they did an experiment I think it was GM corn on rats although I'd have to look it up and I think there was about 400 different genes that change the levels of expression. Um, and they did an experiment uh, with with um, genetically modified Roundup Ready corn, and I'll explain what that is in a minute. And it changed the genetic expression in their uh, in their livers and kidneys. In fact, it led to non-alcoholic fatty liver disease, <gasps> Unbelievable. which which twenty five percent of Americans have. And this was a study that was the most definitive causal study ever done between Roundup and a disease. And they found that the amount, and then actually that was with Roundup, that, was, that wasn't even with the GMO, that was with Roundup. But the study itself, and I'll, I'll get into this, um, the study, you said in some cases, they, you, can't, you can't 
isolate whether it's the corn or the chemical they put on it. Well, they actually did that. And I'll explain how they isolated, but let me just explain to the audience who, who may not know. The main reason they genetically engineer crops is to allow those crops to be sprayed with herbicide. So Monsanto sells Roundup herbicide and they sell Roundup ready seeds. And these herbicide tolerant crops are 80% of all GMOs planted in the world. And the herbicide like Roundup gets absorbed into the crop, into the food portion of the crop, and you cannot wash it off. Yeah, they think, oh, let's just soak our vegetables, but that's not the case. It's actually inside the vegetable. And for listeners who want to learn more about uh, Roundup, glyphosate, and the, 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 the health implications, please go back and listen to episode 89 with Dr. Stephanie Seneff, um, who is the whistleblower around the, the why we really need to not consume Roundup with glyphosate um, in our diet. So that, that, that would be a great episode to listen to to complement this one. Um, we're talking Talking more about GMOs in this one, and and she talks more about Roundup, but but it's they, they go hand in hand. It's you, you can't absolutely you can't get one without the other. <laughs> so so when you when you when you look at what is the impact of genetically modified Roundup ready soy, you don't know if it's the soy or the Roundup residue. So when they tested it uh, in Italy, they found damage to the testes, damage to the to the pancreas, damage to the liver. They found accelerated aging. Uh, when in Russia, an un, a non-published study found that um, by the third generation of hamsters, uh, most of the hamsters were sterile. Uh, there was a four or five times increased rate in in infant mortality. There were birth defects of hair growing in the mouths at high concentrations in the GM-fed group. There was another Russian study that was published that showed that uh, when they started feeding female rats genetically modified soy starting two weeks before they got pregnant and continuing, more than half of the babies died within three weeks compared to a 10% rate when it was non-GM soy. The babies were also smaller on average and mostly sterile. So we had a situation where you don't know whether it's the Roundup, which does link to uh, reproductive disorders, and or whether it's the GMO. So one group in France did a very uh, wise experiment where they fed rats either Roundup Ready corn that had been sprayed with Roundup, Roundup Ready corn that had not been sprayed with Roundup, or Roundup without the corn. And they found that all three groups had multiple massive tumors, premature death, and organ damage. Mm. And so it was both the genetic engineering process and the Roundup individually and together, which were linked to these very serious disorders, including a much higher death rate. Now, if you look at what could be causing, if you look at all the, well, first of all, let me, let me just take a step back and say, we don't have a smoking gun. We have a smoking shotgun. If you look at the animal feeding studies on GMOs and Roundup, they yield a whole bunch of different diseases and disorders or or indications of those diseases and disorders. When you look at the reports from doctors and individuals who've removed GMOs from diets, it's the same category of diseases. Same with livestock, same with pets. When you look at these type of diseases and you look at the epidemiological evidence, and Stephanie Seneff has looked at that and Nancy Swanson has looked at that and have published these, you can see that more than 30 different diseases are rising in parallel with the increased use of GMOs and the Roundup sprayed on them. And then when you look at, let's just look at three components of what constitutes a GMO, they would predict these type of diseases and disorders. The three components, one, we've talked about it, the process of genetic engineering itself. As the FDA scientists said, it can create, it can create allergens, toxins, new diseases and nutritional problems. You're, you're throwing a dart into the into the um, genome, can mess up any particular gene, increase, decrease, et cetera. That in itself can do it. The Roundup can do it. In fact, Roundup is a probable human carcinogen, according to the World Health Organization. It blocks certain metabolic pathways that could potentially reduce the amount of serotonin, melatonin, and dopamine, and reduce the amount of detoxification in the liver, and also the production of vitamin D and the, and the metabolism of 
of pharmaceuticals. It's a, it's an antibiotic, so it can damage the beneficial gut bacteria, causing dysbiosis. It can link to leaky gut. It's also linked to birth defects, to suppression of digestive enzymes, to damage of the microvilli along the intestinal walls. It's also a mitochondrial toxin, so the energy centers can be affected, and an endocrine disruptor, which can throw off the entire functioning of the system. So if you look at just those categories, which is a pretty substantial list, that could explain and understand and explain all of these particular diseases and why they were on the rise. Now, that's the second. The third is what's called BT toxin. I mentioned that 80% of GMOs are sprayed with herbicide, mostly Roundup. What do the other 20% do? Well, nearly all of them are the corn and cotton plants that produce a toxin that kills insects. So these plants are registered pesticides with the EPA. Now, we eat corn and we eat this toxin that pokes holes in the walls of the guts of insects to kill them. But it wasn't supposed to poke holes in human cells, but they never tested it. They just assumed it until 2012 in the Journal of Applied Toxicology, and it showed in high concentrations and laboratory conditions, it does poke holes, the same type of holes in human cells that kill insects. That could also lead to, leaky, lead to leaky gut. Also, the BT toxin promotes immune reactions, allergic reactions in humans and immune reactions in mice. And so we're eating this BT toxin, and it turns out in Canada, in Sherbrooke University Hospital, they found the BT toxin in the blood of 93% of the pregnant women tested and 80% of their unborn fetuses. Oh now, if it gosh. gets in the... If it gets in the blood, it's toxic to red blood cells. So that could explain a lot of the, the problems we're seeing. And it, how did it get in the blood? Well, maybe it poked the holes in the walls of the cells and then allowed it to get into the blood. But if it gets in the blood, it should wash out very quickly. And I point this out in the movie Genetic Roulette, that the authors of the study were wondering why 93% had the BT toxin when it wasn't Mexico where they eat corn tortillas every day. Most of the corn in Canada is high fructose corn syrup or corn oil, and they don't have the BT toxin in it anymore. So they were thinking maybe it was the milk and meat of the animals, the livestock that are fed BT corn oh. and BT cotton meal. So that the BT toxin may have been preserved in the flesh of the animal or, or produced into the milk, and that may be the cause. I think there's another uh, viable cause that they didn't talk about. In 2004, in the Nature Biotechnology uh, a Journal, they demonstrated that when you insert a gene, like they did into soy, that creates Roundup-ready soybeans, that part of that gene actually transferred into the DNA, integrated into the DNA of bacteria living inside our intestines. <gasps> now, it, it, they did not... They were not able to determine whether the transferred gene continued to function producing genetically modified proteins from the bacteria. But if it did, and it might, because the promoter section, in other words, the on switch, which turns the gene on, also transferred with the genetic material. If it did, it means that 24-7, our own gut bacteria could be producing genetically modified proteins. Now, if that's the case with BT corn, Monsanto's BT corn, for example, it might turn our intestinal flora into living pesticide factories where it produces the BT toxin, which creates immune reactions and can poke holes in human cells on a 24-7 basis. And that might explain why 93% of the pregnant women in Canada tested had the BT toxin, because they may have been producing it inside their own intestines. Oh my God, this is like a horror science fiction story. Because... We keep doing this. We're we're gonna kill off our own species. Well, you know, if you look at the at the charts, and we have some of those charts on our site, um, at the different diseases, it's incredible how many diseases rise in parallel with the use of GMOs and glyphosate. I, I, call, I use the word glyphosate. Let's be clear. Glyphosate is what Monsanto patented and put it as the basis for Roundup. Glyphosate is was originally patented as a chelator to clean boilers and pipes. It was patented as an antibiotic. It's patented as an herbicide. And it's not the only poison in Roundup. In fact, there are other elements that are as much as 10,000 times more toxic. And as a whole, 
uh, Roundup can be 125 times more toxic than glyphosate alone. But glyphosate has been tested and shown to be a probable human carcinogen, et cetera. So I'll use the word glyphosate or Roundup. And there's other, there's other herbicides other than Roundup that use glyphosate as an active ingredient. Um, so, in fact, the main reason they genetically engineered crops is because glyphosate was going off patent. And Monsanto wanted to sell seeds that would force farmers to use only their their produced glyphosate-based herbicide. So they'd have to sign a contract that if they bought the Roundup-ready seeds, they used Roundup herbicide instead of the Chinese generic variety. So that's where we're at. I mean, so we have the B, they have the process of genetic engineering, the BT toxin, and the Roundup, all as part of this. Now, there's also, I'm going to give you the names of the GMOs so that you'll help it'll help you to avoid them uh, soy corn cotton which is edible in the form of cottonseed oil canola sugar beets which constitutes the majority of sugar in the united states it's not the table beets that you buy sugar beets and alfalfa which is used for animal feed all of those six have Roundup Ready varieties, and all but the alfalfa, it's more than 90% of the acreage in North America that's GMO. So if you buy any sugar that does, or any genetic, or any soybean oil, or or high fructose corn syrup, or canola, or canola oil, or cottonseed oil, any of those, if it doesn't say non-GMO or organic, then you can accept that 90% minimum of the content will be from genetically engineered sources. Now. The corn and cotton also are producing BT toxin. And there's a Monsanto corn on the cob. Not And the corn on the cob is not 90%. It's much less. But there's still corn on the cob out there that has five genes inserted in it, um, Roundup Ready and BT toxin producing. So that could be some of the worst food to eat. Now, in addition to those six, you have papaya from Hawaii or China. You have... Also, some zucchini and yellow squash. And recently, they put on the market both apples and potatoes that were engineered not to brown when sliced. <gasps> no. Yep. That's disgusting. Not only is it disgusting, but they used a technology called double-stranded RNA, which is a small piece of RNA, maybe 21 nucleotides long, which matches with its complement on the DNA, so it finds its own complement and silences that gene. And it silences the gene that produces the protein that causes the browning. Now, it has been found that if you feed mice double-stranded RNA, it can turn off or on genes. I can turn off or on a gene in the liver. Oh my gosh. And, yeah, it gets worse. They fed honeybees one meal of, this was in the, in the, in the young stage of the honeybees, uh, one meal of double-stranded RNA. And they expected this double-stranded RNA to be a control, meaning it would have no impact. Well, it actually changed over the, the, next few weeks, over 1,400 genes in terms of their expression. And the way it changes is through direct link up with this short piece of RNA. It can silence genes within the DNA of the honeybee. That changes the expressions there, and then those changed expressions have secondary influences on other genes. So you have primary and secondary changes all from a double-stranded RNA that was not supposed to have any impact at all. Now, this is such a profoundly impactful technology that it can it can affect. Basically, if you put it into a into a crop, you can affect any insect that bites the crop. You can affect any human that eats the crop, and so it prompted Jonathan Lundgren and others at the USDA to write an article saying we do not have a regulatory framework sufficient to test for the risks associated with double-stranded RNA. And then the year later, the EPA scientists talking about double-stranded herbicides and pesticides. So it's not just the crop, it's the actual using double-stranded RNA as a spray. They said pretty much the same thing. 
But the USDA, under political influence and economic influence, approved the apple and the potato, and it's now on the market, which means that if we eat these things, it's the innate potato and the Arctic apple. If we eat the innate potato or the Arctic apple, it is theoretically possible that it could reprogram human DNA expression. The chances of it linking up these 21 uh, nucleotides, the, the chance of it finding a match in the 2 billion base pairs sequence of the DNA is 100%. It will guarantee it will find a match. Whether it silences that or not has not been evaluated. And so it's we think that it may be a far more dangerous technology than anything we've dealt, we've discussed so far. This feels like epigenetics or, or sorry uh, eugenics this feels like eugenics this feels like world war three on a silent level this feels like the cold war against against the individual i mean that is the most horrific thing i have ever heard if you had told me this was the plot for the next star trek movie i would have believed you <laughs> well i have to say now you realize why when you said what can we do about it I said, I'll tell you later. <laughs> I had to give the bigger impact. And I'll tell you, I'm going to give you good news. So you will be able to breathe more easily in a few minutes. So there is good news coming. Are there any other foods? Because, I mean, I've heard of tomato. I don't think you mentioned that. I've heard of lettuce. Um, are, are there any other foods we need to know about? Uh, what about wheat? I mean, I know that they spray glyphosate um, as, uh, I mean, D Dr. Stephanie Senef outlined that um, it's not just in GMO foods that they're spraying Roundup or glyphosate. Uh, they're using it to, as a finishing agent in certain crops or grains. Um, but in terms of genetic uh, modification, uh, are there any, any other ones that we need to be aware of? There are no other GMO crops currently on the market. Nearly every um, commercialized fruit, vegetable, grain, bean, etc. has a counterpart somewhere in the pipeline. Um, the tomatoes were introduced that were called flavor saver tomatoes. They were designed for longer shelf life and they were introduced in 1994, but taken off the market within three years. Um, there was a potato put on the market early that was taken off in 2001. Now there's a new potato. Uh, but there's also all of the milk, meat and eggs from animals that have been fed GMOs. And, 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 you know, there's the possibility of bioaccumulation. Uh, Stephanie Seneff's co-author, Anthony Samsel, was able to obtain the secret Monsanto studies that were under seal at the EPA with help from his senator. He's not allowed to share those 20,000 pages with the public, but he is allowed to report on them. And in his co-authored co article with Stephanie Seneff, showed that there is, in fact, bioaccumulation in the tissues glands and organs of these animals with glyphosate. So if there's bioaccumulation, it means that you're, you're building up a quantity of glyphosate in the body of these animals that can be consumed by humans. Uh, it could also be potentially in the milk and the eggs. And I, I've had some interesting talks to people who absolutely say they can tell with violent reactions if they're eating, for example, meat from animals that have been fed GMOs versus not. Someone, uh, a friend of mine, we wrote, who wrote about a blog, and it's on our website now, um, she was told actually at a farmer's market that a uh, pork chop was non-GMO fed and, and was eating halfway through the pork chop. She started getting violently ill. And uh, she doesn't have that reaction to um, and meat that's been fed non-GM. There's someone I know who told me a story. I did not talk to the people directly, but this farmer I spoke with did. And he said that they have their own chickens and they eat the eggs every day. And one day the mother and the daughter started having an anaphylactic shock and was rushed off to the hospital. So the father called the feed producer, the feed salesman, and said, was there any change in the feed before today? And he said, yes, I just we just ran out of non-GMO feed, so I delivered you GMO feed. So this was oh. unsuspecting. And so they had they apparently had a reaction the very first time they ate the eggs from the chickens that were fed non-GMO feed. So these are anecdotal evidence, but you know, after hearing literally thousands of stories, I believe them. <laughs> and I used to not believe them, but now I hear them from doctors, I hear them from scientists, I hear them and they and I believe they are something we should pay attention to.
Yes, when I was a child, um, I could go to the movie theater, and I mean, I don't go to the movie theaters often, but when I could go to the movie theater, I could get a nice big thing of real butter on popcorn, not have a problem. Anytime, and I, and I, and again, I don't now. I really don't go to the movie theaters. Um, but you know, in the last ten years, um, whenever I go to a movie theater, get a nice big thing of popcorn. I can't finish it without having my eyes start burning. And for three days, I have um, um, digestive upset, major inflammatory digestive upset. And I thought, oh, I must be just allergic to corn. You know, it's one of those things where people, you know, get allergic to a grain, right? But, you know, hearing that what I was actually doing when I was a kid was eating regular corn and what I was doing as an adult was eating um, genetically modified, um, uh, you know, and also filled. Actually, with- actually, before you say that, because it's not entirely true here. Listen to this. This is this is part of the good news. What you were eating was corn cooked in genetically modified oil ah. and, po- and po- probably probably. Uh, coated with genetically modified margarine, uh-huh. but but the popcorn is not GMO. Okay, so this is what, the distinction of of where we need where we can figure out uh, where is it actually coming from. So if we still wanted to eat corn, um, we corn, can, we can corn, find yes. Not, okay, great. Popcorn is not GMO yet. It doesn't even cross pollinate with oh. field corn. If it does, it's very, very rare. And so you have a situation where, because they haven't commercialized the popcorn yet as a GMO, popcorn is safe, even if it doesn't say non-GMO or organic. Of course, organically grown is better. But you don't want to cook it in cottonseed oil, which they do in a lot of theaters, or corn oil, or soybean oil, or canola oil. And margarine, Forget it. And then, of course, the butter could be from cows that have been treated with bovine growth hormone and fed GMOs. So it's like it's the it's the accoutrement. You know, it's like you're, you're you can have a 100 percent grass fed burger and then you put corn syrup ketchup on it, you know, or things like that or mayonnaise, <laughs> mayonnaise with soybean oil. So um, you, you have to be careful of the of the side events here. Mm-hmm. Yes. And when I do make popcorn at home, I don't have that reaction. Because right. I'm making it with all of the things I already I already oh know all the ingredients and I don't have that reactions but I do have that reaction when I go to the um, go to the movie theater and so uh, like you said it it's not the popcorn itself but it was I mean the popcorn was probably grown with some kind of uh, pesticide could then, be yeah and then of course um, the oil that was cooked in and the the, the margarine and, and lots and lots of uh, chemicals and uh, GMO um, in that. Uh, okay, great. So we've painted this picture where we're literally, if we just put our head in the sand and we go to the grocery store and put, just put stuff in our cart and don't really, you know, pre- pretend like we hadn't listened to this interview that, that we will eat something that is going to screw up our DNA. It's going to happen. We it's, this isn't, this isn't a matter of if this is when. So, so if you put your head in the sand, it might be safer to eat the sand than the food. But <laughs> <laughs> and I call when I go to the, when I look at the you know supermarkets and what they're selling I call a lot of it FSOs food shaped objects um, that are that are not necessarily edible but let me let me I'm going to give some I'm going to give a broader picture of what a non-GMO purchase can do for our community and for the world and then I will give instructions or or tips how to avoid GMOs and Roundup in general. Um, Because I'm going to describe, first of all, I'm going to bring you back to my book, Seeds of Deception, where I said at the beginning, Susan Arpad Pustai's wife answered the door and reporters were gathering in front of her and many more were running from their the cars in their street and she said she couldn't speak about what happened. She would be sued. They handed her a piece of paper. She, she called for her husband. He took it. The letterhead was his former institute, the Rowett Institute, one of the leading researchers, uh, uh, nutritional research institutes in the world. And he started reading it. In the meantime, 30 reporters were filing past them into their living room as he was reading that the that he could finally speak about what happened. What happened was those reporters 20 minutes earlier were at a press conference at the Rowan Institute where the 
director had casually mentioned that the restrictions on Pustai's speaking to the press had been lifted. And before he finished his sentence, they were out the door. <laughs> Because seven months earlier, it was there was a huge, uh, big scandal in the newspapers, and he wasn't able to respond, and all sorts of lies were said about him, and he wasn't able to respond to them because it was an effort to destroy his reputation in order to protect the reputation of GMOs. But when the when, by an order of parliament, he was able to speak. The 30 reporters started reporting on GMOs and created a firestorm in the press. Within a month, over 700 articles on GMOs were in the paper in the UK alone. Within 10 weeks, there were so many people in Europe that were concerned about eating GMOs based on what they had read that on April 27th, 1999, Unilever said, no more GMOs in our European brands. The next day, Nestle said the same thing. The next, next week, virtually everyone else. The tipping point of consumer rejection based on informed consumers kicked GMOs out in 1999 and 2000 in Europe. But that same Arpad Pustai story that caused all of this scandal in the press in the EU and throughout Europe was described as one of the 10 most underreported events in the year in the United States by Project Censored. And so the unsuspecting U.S. consumer continued to be fed GMOs by the same companies that removed it for the finicky or what we'll call informed European consumers. So we know that because we're talking about a commodity that's purchased and eaten by people, we can eliminate GMOs without changing government policy because the European Commission is actually pro-GMO. Their version of the FDA, the European Food Safety Authority, is staffed with people who are pro-GMO. They continue to try and approve GMOs, but the food companies kick them out. So what we did with our Institute for Responsible Technology, with me giving a thousand lectures and traveling to 45 countries and most states, and I've been educating people with behavior change messaging. If you want to know what behavior change messaging is, just replay the podcast so far. It's truth. It's telling people messaging that affects health. This stuff can affect our health, and we know what we know, and we keep hearing the lies from the other side, but I, in, these, in this messaging, I, I will take more time usually to expose the, eye, the lies of Monsanto, to expose the lies and the liars of the, of the FDA. But we're focusing more on the health here for this particular audience. And this is inspiring people to want to seek healthier food for themselves and especially their children and even their pets. So what we have now are so many people seeking non-GMO. We have 57% of Americans who believe that GMOs are, are unsafe and are concerned about it, depending on which survey it varies. That is enough to create a tipping point. The tipping point in the United States is underway. We have the tipping point completed in the natural products industry, not entirely, but largely. The, everyone's rushing to the non-GMO project label, which is a good third-party verification system. And now we have Nestle's advertising on TV that its coffee creamer is non-GMO. We have Danon committing to remove its GMO animal feed over the next three years. Chipotle removing GM ingredients from its direct ingredients and wants to do it with its animal feed. We have Del Monte and Hershey's and Campbell's and Cheerios and grape nuts, and I can't believe it's not butter, and all these different products. Hellman's has a version. Similac has an advanced baby formula that's non-GMO. So many different companies are either switching or introducing new products that are non-GMO. We can say with confidence that the tipping point is underway, and many companies are quietly, non-publicly removing all GM ingredients, which may take a few years, from all of its products. And so we are in the non-GMO revolution. And that is one of the consequences of being sure that you seek non-GMO and whenever you can tell the people at the restaurant and tell the people at the grocery store that you're seeking non-GMO so that you have a little extra influence, not just your purchasing, but you're mentioning it to others so they realize why the shift is going to the non-GMO product so they will stock more so that the food companies will will produce more and that the GMOs will become obsolete. We have to vote with our fork. 
You know, we have to, our, the power is in us, 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 like you said, telling people, telling the grocery store, telling, telling the farmer, telling uh, the food company, telling the restaurant what we want. But then we have to vote with our fork. We must put our money towards non-GMO and be vocal about it. Because if enough of us do it, then those companies um, feel confident that they can move in that direction. And you know what my attitude is? is that we don't do this as a boycott. We do this as self-protection. Mm -hmm. A boycott has, is going to be limited. I mean, it's easy to get people to hate Monsanto. You can describe the stories about the farmers and the patents and how they've they've offered bribes to the Canadian, uh, allegedly, or to Canadian officials who said they were offered one to $2 million to approve bovine growth hormone. They offered bribes to Indonesian officials and were convicted or admitted to it and fined. So we can, we can get people to hate Monsanto. But... To get people to actually change their diet, we don't need to do it for political reasons. We can do it to save ourselves. But knowing that it also has the repercussions and that it can save humanity and save, you know, basically, and I'll say this in a big way and then I'll explain why I'm being so, what may sound hyperbole, save all living beings and all future generations. Let me explain that. The biotech, biotech industry representative, actually it was a Anderson Consulting, spoke at a 1999, it was an earlier version of Anderson, spoke at a 1999 biotech conference in San Francisco about how they had worked with Monsanto as their client. And they started asking the executives to describe their ideal future in 15 to 20 years. And the executives described a world in which 100% of all commercial seeds were genetically engineered and patented. And Anderson worked backwards from that goal to create the strategy and tactics to achieve it. So their goal was to replace nature, to eliminate the products of the billions of years of evolution with designer organisms designed for greater profit and control. That goal has only expanded because now they're introducing genetically modified mosquitoes in several countries. Houston wants to release them. South Florida wants to release them. They want to release open air genetically modified moths. The FDA approved genetically modified salmon, but it's not on the market. There's 35 other fish. They want to genetically engineer out the livestock. Um, in livestock, the mothering influence, so you can separate the, the kids with no emotional pain from these mother animals. They want to they basically make commodify nature and all of its organisms to meet industrial agriculture or other ways to exploit patents. I think I'm going to throw want, up. This is the but, most, this is the, my so, stomach is turning. So, so we're going to get you the good news in a minute. So the key, <laughs> the key is, so they want to genetically modify algae to produce an outdoor algae. They want to genetically modify bacteria, fungi, basically everything that they has a DNA. They want to change it and own it and patent it and get it out it commercially before the patent expires and long before the science is predictable. So we are at a, at a point in life, in civilization, where we are looking at two crossroads. Are we going to eliminate nature and turn it over to companies like Monsanto? Or are we going to protect nature? Now, I know that we want to protect the nature of nature and to protect out this, this self-propagating long-term pollution. The only thing that lasts longer than the self-propagating pollution of the gene pool is extinction. Because as long as the gene pool is in existence and it's contaminated, it's contaminated. So we are in a situation where if we turn over the keys of the kingdom to the GMO companies, then it won't be 11 food crops it will be all the food crops. Right now, it's easy to go to the produce section and get non-GMO. You just avoid the, 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 unless it's organic, you avoid the zucchini, the yellow squash, the corn on the cob, and the, and the papaya if it's from Hawaii or China, and apples if it's the innate apple or the Arctic, the Arctic apple or the innate potato. That's all you need to do. And everything else on the, on the, on the uh, produce section is non-GMO. If we give them the keys of the kingdom, everything will be GMO except the organic space. So what we need to do is find an excuse to do something. Now, the good news is that when we look back 100 years and they say, what saved the genetic integrity of our planet 100 years ago? And it may seem bizarre and crazy and weird, but it might be increased sales of grape nuts at Walmart because grape nuts has the non-GMO project verification on the front of it. It might be simply movement 
of consumers buying non-GMO products, changing the marketplace, and for the same motivation that would drive companies to genetically engineer, that same motivation to higher profits will drive them to not. And so we want people to do other things active, you know, as activists. We have a speaker training. We have an activist training. We have a tipping point network around North America. We have ways that people can become a click and, a click and send revolutionary using our Facebook page and our newsletter. We have ways to engage people's actions. And of course, we're a nonprofit, so we can accept people's donations and act on behalf of humanity trying to stop GMOs, and we've been very successful. But what is so important is to share the information about why GMOs are dangerous. And so sharing this podcast and sharing the movie Genetic Roulette, The Gamble of Our Lives, that turns out to be the number one most effective tool for convincing people to avoid eating GMOs. And the film we're about to release later this year, we're still in the final stages raising money for the very expensive home stretch, is called Secret Ingredients, and you can watch the trailer at secretingredientsmovie.com. I'll mention it again later. And that's about families who heal from serious conditions when they switch to organic. Because you mentioned Roundup is not just limited to GMOs. It is sprayed on wheat, barley, rye, oats, potatoes, sweet potatoes, lentils, uh, sugar cane, uh, so many different products. Tobacco. Tobacco, it's just not, it's not good enough to eat non-GMO. We have to eat organic now. And we have three families in this film and in secret ingredients that switched to organic. Two of the autistic kids are no longer autistic. The third was switched to a mainstream classroom. We have a clinic that had 77 infertile couples, a chiropractic clinic. In addition to chiropractic, they put them all on an organic diet. All 77 have healthy children. We have people that had recovered from cancer, from skin conditions, from massive pain problems, so many areas, inflammation, gut problems, so many areas cleared up, in some cases 100% from eating an organic diet. And we have doctors saying this is typical among a percentage of our patients, and we have scientists explaining why. So what we have done is we've created the tools with the behavior change messaging using accurate information that's highly referenced and clear that can convert as I started back 21 years ago, can taking the interviewing scientists and converting the science into English that was compelling using stories and compelling language. That has turned out to be the formula that has resulted in a tipping point underway in the United States. And this is how people can help not only avoid GMOs, switch to organic whenever possible and share these films. So that's what I, I want to suggest as a way that people can, can help protect all living beings, all future generations, and everyone who eats from the plans and the existing GMOs. You know, what I see here is I see, first of all, on a personal level, right? We have to personally protect ourselves and our family, right? Um, we can make that by the daily choices going to the grocery store, right? So, so we can just we can we can just put a bubble over our own family and go. I'm going to eat non-GMO, or I'm going to my family is going to invest in organic food. And there's a way to eat organic and non-GMO food that is affordable. It just takes uh, being a bit crafty. Um, I know because my family's made that tr transition and and uh, and and also figured out how to budget for it. Um, and, and when I, when we went organic, so that was the first thing I did. I, I was, I had a lot of health problems, um, you know, t 10 years ago, my, my whole adult child, uh, my whole adult life was, was, was dealing with major health problems. And, um, and then about, um, eight, nine years ago, um, I was having on a monthly basis. I, I had, was on antibiotics. I was constantly, wow. I had infections and um and and then my husband and i saw this documentary about um i mean it was just like back when we got netflix and we we're watching all these food documentaries we're starting to wake up um right around 2008 we started to really wake up and see what was going on and we saw this one documentary in the 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 one of the C ceos of whole foods or something was talking and um and we turned to each other and we thought, and he said, vote, vote with your fork. And that, that, that has really always stuck with me. Um, because the latest statistic is I think only 8% of our farmlands is, is, is safe or dedicated to organic. I, 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 less, I, it's I, less. Oh, I keep hearing that. And that's just, to me, that's heartbreaking and shocking. Um, so so my, my husband and I went as organic as possible. And in within a month, I stopped 
getting infections. I stopped going to the doctor for um, antibiotics. Wow. And, and, and nothing else changed. I was still, I still had uh, lots of other health issues, but that one change was so noticeable and then we um, learned about what foods to that our bodies, because, um, you know, we're all bio individuals. So maybe someone really is better as a vegan. Maybe someone's better as more paleo. Everyone's different. And we our body goes through different changes, you know. Uh, so I'm, I'm not saying that one diet fits all. But I found I figured out what, what foods are healing for me. And more and more of my illnesses uh, began, to, my symptoms began to drop off. And then I introduced supplements and uh, actually organic <laughs> non-GMO supplements. Mm-hmm. And and more of my symptoms began to fell off, and and now um, I'm the healthiest um, I, I've ever been since I you know in my adult adult life. Um, but that was my first experience with with going uh, with the difference between um, eating convention they call it conventionally grown food. I'm doing the little air quotes because um, it's kind of ridiculous. You think conventionally grown would be how our great grandparents grew grew crops, or chemi- but we call them chemically grown. Yeah, chemically. It's chemically grown food to as organic as possible that within within such a short period of time my immune system recovered and um and began to show up (laughs) so you know there are so many stories like this what you're saying i mean it's really important story on the other hand i have heard thousands of these and it's like so predictable in fact in the film we have a family that had 20 the one secret ingredients that's coming up we have a a family that has that had 21 chronic conditions between the five of them and there was paralysis and autism and um, a breast tumor in the guy and, and, the, and, the, and the husband and uh, eczema and hormonal problems and all sorts of things. And she, the, the mother became uh, started studying food and started experimenting on the family, took him off of gluten, took him off of commercial dairy, took him off of soy, took him off of, of um, preservatives. And they were getting better on all those things, but they were still managing the conditions. When she switched to organic, everything went away. And some that some of the changes were within three weeks, things they've been struggling with for years disappeared, and within six months they were all gone. Now, for those who don't know, if you eat or uh, something that's certified organic, is that a hundred percent guaranteed it's not GMO and it doesn't contain um, Roundup and you know, glyphosate and all that? No, it's not allowed to intentionally, but contamination happens. It's the nature of nature. So uh, even the non-GMO project, which is specifically verifying just the non-GMO, they also have an allowable or an action threshold of 0.9%. With with organic, there is no particular threshold because there's no testing requirements. So uh, there was a a blind test of 23 samples in California uh, this past year, and they tested and two of the 23 was animal feed, and it turned out to be 100% GMO. So it was some kind of fraudulent or mistaken shipment. So sometimes or- organic is a problem. Uh, if you have non-GMO project verified, then you also have the advantage of it being tested uh, on an annual basis. Uh, so having both organic and non-GMO project verified on the same product is the best. But if you had to choose between them, organic is better because non-GMO project verified can still allow for chemicals. It still allows for Roundup. And if you have, as you mentioned, wheat, you know, if you have a, a bread that's non-GMO project verified, the wheat might be sprayed with Roundup. Same with the oats, etc. cetera. So um, organic does not allow the intentional use of GMOs. It does not allow the intentional use of glyphosate. Sometimes glyphosate will get in there and there'll be low levels of contamination. So in general, it's a good thing. In specific, you can't, tell, can't ever say 100% guaranteed. Unless you grow it yourself. Even then, you may be spraying it with water that has glyphosate in it, mm. or using chicken manure from chicken that would be fed GMO. So you have to. Mm-hmm. There's, there's. Any time you have an input, there's the. And even spraying, you know, they found glyphosate in 60 to 100 percent of the air samples and rain samples in the Midwest. Oh my gosh. So, and it's also in the groundwater and in, in the surface water. So you can find it because it's you know over 300 million, 300 million pounds of it were sprayed in the United States year, yearly about that. So it's in such high use, primarily because of the GMO acreage of soy, corn, uh, cotton, that it's in our environment. And they find it in um, breast milk. They found it in urine. Um, in fact, the people and the animals that had higher levels of glyphosate in their urine were more sickly. 
Mm -hmm. uh, so you can actually get your urine tested. You can go to our website and sign up and get your urine tested. So uh, how to avoid? I think we should probably just... Yes, and I just want to talk about your website. So which website is it for, for example, the um, to test your urine for glyphosate? Okay, so our main mothership website is responsibletechnology.org. We're the Institute for Responsible Technology, and responsibletechnology.org can lead to most anything else. So from there, I'm on that website right now. We can go on the menu and we can donate to your cause, which is, I think, so important. If this if this um, interview uh, was as eye-opening for you as it was for me, please donate uh, what you can. Let's help, let's help uh, get this message out. Now, you also mentioned, and I found this very interesting, that if people people really want to um, become activists that you have like an activist training program uh, is that yes. uh, so under the tab that says take action um oh gmo speaker training online course that that yeah. sounds highly interesting uh, mm -hmm. you have um an action toolkit you have a, a section under take action for parents for schools for retailers for healthcare providers i know we have a lot of doctors and um healthcare providers that are listeners uh so uh, responsibletechnology.org go under the take action tab and uh and what does it look like to become a, a gmo speaker um to get a toolkit um what is it what does it look like well, we in the online speaker training, uh, we give people a PowerPoint presentation. It's fully scripted, and we explain the answers to all the questions that might come up and the background so that you get a sense of how to talk about it if you're speaking before a group. But you also get the basic elements of a two-minute or a one-minute elevator speech on GMOs. What are the components? You know, what do you want to share with people? And how do you share it? And what are the data, what's the data points that could, could give you the confidence to make that statement? So um, we've had about 1,500 people uh, take the training. Uh, I used to do it in person as well, but now mostly it's online. And um, we had an activist training portion with it uh, that is also there to the end of it, and that it tells people how to get organized, um, which is how to deal with press, how to deal with other organizations, how to even organize a group after giving a lecture to get them interested and to start a group. So um, we've had a lot, you know, I've traveled more than anyone else in the in the world about speaking about the health of GMOs. So as I travel all around speaking in the United States, you know, I would originally just speak, inspire people and leave, and they would have nothing to do. <laughs> So it's like it's like we're all gonna die goodbye. No, but it was. <laughs> but I I would I learned how to start a group and have it. By the time we met for half an hour, they would know when they were meeting, where they were meeting, how often they were meeting, who else was in the group, where they lived, what the major resources were in the area, and what people wanted to work on, and what they were gonna do before the next meeting. So we have a very specific what we call activist circle that we train people how to run that. 30 minute meetings in order to establish the next meeting. It so it's like David and Goliath, except, um, you know, David, who seems so small, us as individuals, we seem, we feel so powerless against, um, everything going on. And I, I feel as though people might, you know, when you say it's tested in the air, it's tested in our soil, it's in our water supply, people might feel hopeless. They might feel like, well, you know, I guess we're screwed. I'm just going to go on with my life because um, it's something that's invisible. We can't, you know, we can't smell it. We can't see it, to, but but it's contaminating us. It's in, in, in this, it's hidden in our food and, and then it's shifting our DNA and, you know, we're all screwed. Um, so I can see that some people might feel hopeless. And, and I know I have at times felt hopeless when, when kind of, when facing this. And what I want to say to the listener is, um, when we get together as a group, the da David is the David is bigger than Goliath because we are the many and they are the few. And we are so totally winning. We yes. are totally winning, Ashley. We are. People say, "How's the GMO fight going?" We are winning. 
We've ticked it out of the natural products industry. We're tipping it out of the mainstream. Our institute now wants to extend it to animal feed and export the model that worked in the United States all over the world. So we, and we also want to go deeper into the science. I'm just about to publish a peer-reviewed study uh, that, that uh, is about the survey that we did and goes deep into the digestive problems because that was the number one category. So it's quite a long, in-depth study. I want to do more training for healthcare professionals. So we're going to try and create that this year. We've got a whole GMO pets program, GMO free pets program that we're building. So there's a lot of things to do. And we are, we, we are basically in a situation where we're relying entirely on donations for us to move forward with some of these projects that have been sitting, waiting to move forward for the money to come. However, we haven't stopped giving the behavior change message in general, and we're winning. We have the, the average American now thinks GMOs are, are a problem. And the other side is going crazy. The Congress just allocated $3 million to the FDA to promote GMOs and tell people it's safe. Uh, we just discovered through uh, leaked do or documents that were made public because of a lawsuit that Monsanto has thousands of trolls where they respond to every single statement about GMOs or Roundup on the internet that they can. Every single statement. Do not let anything go is their concept. And so Anytime you post, you'll find a, tra a troll who's actually being paid direct indirectly by Monsanto who's going to try and convince you that you're wrong. So now that you know, you can say, ah, everyone, you should go to the, the, the document that tells people that it's all Monsanto trolls. And here we found one. So we can we are equipping people with the information they need to be bold to, so that they could tell other people and so that they can be healthy, so that they can avoid GMOs and Roundup. That is fantastic. So for those who were at any point feeling hopeless, we are winning and we need to help. We need to help go to responsibletechnology.org. Let's let's tip it over it so that we 100% win. I love I love hearing that we are winning and it, we there's still a lot of fight left and you, you definitely need funding. You know, I, I just get this vision of, of 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 my listeners taking this to their to their churches, taking this to oh, their yeah. community centers, taking this to their um, to the, their children's schools, taking this to their health care providers. Um, and if you sign up as a as a, a speaker and then or, or get your 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 priest or, you know, your rabbi or, you know, <laughs> whatever, whatever uh, religious uh, community you belong to, get get your leader uh, interested in this and, and then get the community interested in this. Um, churches, uh, you know, are, are, are so powerful because um, they really look to to help. Right. And so that they, they raise lots of money and they donate lots of money. And if you could get uh, your church uh, interested in raising money for this cause, I think that would be so, so powerful. So that's just and another I, another way we can do it. Um, I'm and by the way, I, actually, by the way, GMO for some religions means God move over. <laughs> oh. <laughs> oh. Oh. Oh, that's, that's creepy. Yeah. Hmm. So um, you and it, so we've got responsible technology to Oregon and, and, and there's so much great information there. I really, um, I, I'm, I actually, I, I I started crying when you were talking about your movie, um, the secret ingredients that needs funding. Um, go to uh, let's see here. Um, what what is the website for donating to help that uh, movie uh, get produced? Okay, secretingredientsmovie dot com. Mm -hmm. um, that's that you can see the trailer to the movie. Um, I'll give you the rest of the websites. Um, we have a program focused on Roundup. Uh, and that's at rounduprisks.com. And Roundup is um, being used by a lot of homeowners associations and golf courses and municipalities and schools. So we have a training program, just two hours, free webinar on that rounduprisks.com, where it tells you how three other community leaders got rid of Roundup in their community with three different methods you can use. And some, it, it just took a couple of phone calls and one visit and they were done. And they went, oh, I didn't realize this was a problem. And they not only got rid of Roundup, but they got rid of other toxic chemicals and are using non-toxic healthy alternatives that are effective. So um, we have a whole program for training at rounduprisks.com with a toolkit. We also have non-gmoshoppingguide.com. For, for non-gmo shopping guide, we list all the products that are verified by the non-gmo project. But in addition, we also list the hidden ingredients, the names of the different ingredients. So on, on non-gmoshoppingguide.com, we have 
the list of all the products that have been verified by the non-GMO project, as well as a list of what we call hidden ingredients, which are the ingredients that you can find on the label that might be derived from genetically modified crops or in some cases genetically modified microorganisms. So like maltodextrin and dextrose and things like that, they come from corn. Uh, and you wouldn't know that because it doesn't use the word corn, although corn oil and corn, high fructose corn syrup, you do see the word corn. All of those ingredients are there. So the basic ways to avoid GMOs, and there's four tips. One is to buy organic, and that's by far the number one recommendation. If you can't buy organic, then at least buy products that say non-GMO, and the non-GMO project label is the best. You can also go to the shopping guide and buy products that are listed there. And fourth, buy products that avoid the at-risk ingredients, which is easiest when you're in unprocessed foods around the outside of the supermarket. So if it's, not, if it's processed, it is very likely to contain a derivative of GMOs, soy lecithin, soy protein isolate, uh, some kind of corn sweetener, an oil from GMOs, a sugar from sugar beets, etc. So those are the four ways to avoid GMOs. When you go out to eat, Think about the hidden sources of GMOs. If you go to fast food places, it's all processed. You can't do it. You can't avoid it. If you go to a place that cooks from scratch, they'll still bring in some processed foods like ketchup or mayonnaise. So the condiments, if they cook fully from scratch and it's your meal, then you can make sure they don't use genetically modified oil. So when I go to a restaurant, I will call first and say, what kind of oil do you cook your food in? And if it's soy, corn, cotton, or canola, I'll double check to see if it's not organic or non-GMO. I'm in California, so sometimes it is. But usually if it's that, I say, I don't eat those oils because they're genetically engineered. Do you have any olive oil that's not you know, blended with canola? Or do you, can you cook mine without oil? And if you want to trust the butter, you can cook stuff cooked in butter. And then the salad dressing is another choice. So it, you, won't, you won't want to order uh, you know, the zucchini or the yellow squash, unless you're feeling lucky, uh, or the corn on the cob, you know, you won't want to order the tofu unless you know it's non-GMO. Those are the visible GMOs. So those are usually easy to avoid. It's the invisible ones, which would be this, the oils and the sugar, et cetera, that you may want to avoid. And the other piece is this. Some people are not willing or ready to restrict their diet that much when they go out to eat. A lot of people are very, very strict at home and less strict when they go to other people's houses or when they go out to restaurants. So my overarching recommendation is after you pick a, a system that works for you, if you find yourself eating a GMO, either consciously or accidentally, don't worry about it. Because worrying is toxic, the GMO is toxic, now you have two toxins to deal with. <laughs> just, just don't worry about it. Just do your best to avoid it when you can as much as possible. Yeah. You yeah. know, I saw this um, documentary on uh, Hugh Hefner, the the, the owner of um, um, Playboy, Playboy, right? Yeah. And in it, he was um, he he was going to some you know uh, function, and one of his bunnies uh, brought uh, food from his chef. And so he wouldn't eat wherever he went. He wasn't eating whatever they were cooking there. He brought, it was like um, organic uh, lamb and some <laughs> organic vegetables. And that is, and the, 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 then the chef there had to, with a clean pan without any other ingredients, make just what the raw ingredients were brought, always brought with him. And I thought, man, is this guy just like weird and eccentric? And now I get it. Oh, yeah. I mean, the, the Bush White House, Laura insisted it was all organic. And uh, we understand that the Obama White House was largely oral organic. We don't know, but we think it is. And uh, we also know that um, when someone wrote a letter to the restaurant that was inside Monsanto's headquarters in England in 1999 and asked, uh, do they serve GMOs? They said, because of concerns by our customers, we're removing, we've removed GMOs as much as possible. <laughs> and their customers were, of course, the people working at Monsanto. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> So the the employees of Monsanto know best not to eat their own products. Well, I certainly some of them do, and some of them have, have drank the Kool Aid and think that it's going to save the world, even though the experts realize that actually it works against feeding the hungry world. But that's another story. It does not feed the world. It does not increase yield. It it actually reduces yield on average in many cases. And the world's experts say that GMOs have nothing to offer 
for the goal of feeding the hungry world, eradicating poverty, oh, no. or creating sustainable agriculture. No, they're trying to make money. It's all it's all about money and power, yeah. and which is just yeah. absolutely disgusting. I mean, how much money and power do you need? If if this was a spiritual debate, I would I would start to believe um, that. Um, the evil powers <laughs> that they were like possessed by demons or something because i mean with my heart i could just not imagine if i was put in that situation to ever choose to create a product that caused this much um harm over making money uh, it's, it's it's they're literally making money to harm people and uh and that's that just seems so demonic to me it's it's, it's insane when you were first describing your movie um which really we need to donate to. I, I'm so passionate about um, secret ingredients. Um, so secretingredientsmovie.com. When you mentioned that there were autistic children that literally are no longer on the spectrum after yes. being put on this, can, can you please just um, give us a little bit more information? Because I, I know parents who are, um, you know, in so much heartache uh, trying to do the best for their children. And I, I, I know some children with autism and, and uh, I actually have, have witnessed a child um, who's a, a 15 year old who went from total, like, you know, his, ver his, his level of calm, right? So he's chill, he's calm. And he ate some pretzels and within minutes, cause he, it was at a friend's house and he grabbed a handful of their pretzels, um, and he ate them and within minutes uh, nothing else had happened and everyone was very chill he was trying to put holes in the wall and he became ext extremely violent and over and over again this has happened and I, I hear these stories also from parents where the child will eat um you know at first the parents thought maybe it's gluten that's creating this but the ch children will eat eat this uh, a food and and then they're they're I don't want, I don't know if it's correct to say symptoms, but um, it, it's exacerbated. They're they're they're, um, they're and it, it's painful for them, you know, because obviously f they feel so uncomfortable. They're trying to you know put holes in the wall, and um, and so so I just was like weeping here when you when you mentioned the fact that there were autistic children who by being simply by being put on this diet of non-GMO that they uh, had these results. Can you just um, share with us when, when enough of us can donate and help you complete this movie, secretingredientsmovie.com, what will we see in these children? Well, there was Stephen, who um, I've gotten to know, who I really, really like very much. And um, we show videos of him, home videos, unable to speak, uh, in speech therapy, um, he's he flaps his arms all the time uh, and constantly is self-regulating. And he actually, we didn't mention this in the film, but he cre had little pictures that he created to, to communicate because the words weren't happening. So he created a whole language in pictures. Um, but he was, he was, diet was changing. Um, they took gluten out and they took all these other things out. And finally, they took went to them all organic. And he is now a straight A student, A plus student. He had one A, the rest A pluses. He has friends. He doesn't have to go to any type of therapy. He's just absolutely integrated. And he's a beautiful person. And, and to see the transformation. And then there's another, another family it was interesting. I was I was traveling with the Neil Young tour. They have a Monsanto album that they released a couple years ago. And I was traveling with the the band, you know, speak, you know, or holding a booth about GMOs as part of that Monsanto thing. And someone told me, "Oh, have you talked to this one guy? He's against GMOs, and he had a, a son who was autistic, and he's no longer autistic." And I called him. It was very similar. He was he he had a son who was autistic and a daughter who had asthma. He switched to organic more and more, and the problems went away more and more. And then they and now he's no longer on the spectrum. And then there was a third family, and this family was a family of six. And this woman had no no leanings towards organic whatsoever. She went to an organic conference to get some business for her logistics company, and it was uh, it was shocking to her. And she said, "Okay, we're going to go organic." And she shifted the family to organic, and her son was very seriously autistic. He's still autistic, but they told him he would never be able to go to a mainstream public school. 
He got so much better, he was shifted to the mainstream school. In fact, the whole family's health bill went from about 18,000 a year, the next year down to 9,000, the next year down to 3,000. Then she had to stop cooking for her family because of a family emergency for five months or so. Friends and family cooked and brought food over. So the family was now reverted back to chemical-based food. And everyone's symptoms started coming back. And the autistic boy started tearing up the classroom. And they, it was really serious. And then was now more recently switched back to an organic diet. And he said, things are getting easier in school. So we, we see this correlation in these families. And that's just one of the symptoms. And that's it's a major one because it affects so many people. And I, I think it's interesting that the correlation between autism rates at six years old and the amount of glyphosate that had been sprayed for the previous four years in total. When you took a look at those two correlate two lines along a graph, if it were if it were exactly the same line, it would have an R value of one. The R value of this graph is 0.997. It looks as if it's the same line. And it basically shows a very, very tight correlation between the amount of glyphosate-based herbicides sprayed on soy and corn acreage in the United States and the, and the number of six-year-olds diagnosed with autism in the U.S. And uh, you can watch that. You can listen to the Stephanie Senev interview to hear more about that because she, she was the one that, that linked the two probably as the first person, as the first scientist to do that. And now we think that it's probably both GMOs and the Roundup sprayed on it because there's a lot of problems, as we know, we've talked about with the GMOs direct. And, and you know, a lot of people say, well, there's two arguments. One, we've gotten better at, at detecting autism because now it's a spectrum. So that's why there's more people um, uh, being diagnosed. And, and, and two, um, they, well, we're born with it. People are born with, with, with autism. And, um, and, and what I'd like to point out is that, is that, you 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 you're saying and also i've heard this before that in the in utero uh babies are being exposed to these t these um pesticides these herbicides these you know the genetic the gmo material so as the baby as the fetus is developing it's being exposed to um these toxins and um and these elements that change our genetics um, because the mom's eating soy or even just soy oil, uh, the oil from soy or the oil from corn. Um, and, uh, and, and so there's, there's that. Um, but then when you see that graph and, and Dr. Stephanie Seneff is a, a MIT top research scientist. She's, she's got a, she's, got, she's got the most brain power I've ever met. That's episode 89. And she, um, did show that, um, that the more we use glyphosate, which is Roundup, the more autism there was. And it was so precise that you couldn't tell the difference between the two graphs. And, and that's definitely, um, that's definitely something that is not coincidence. So the, the point is here that we have enough information at least to make our own decisions. I mean, we can convince, I can easily convince any open-minded scientist that at the very least that GMO should never have been introduced at the current state of knowledge and that there's high risks and that if someone looking even further at the data would realize, oh my God, this stuff could be one of the most dangerous uh, substances on the planet causing some of the biggest problems in health in the United States in particular because we, we eat so many GMOs. So the point here is this. We have enough information to confidently make decisions. So my suggestion, my bottom line suggestion, in addition to getting involved, in addition to making a donation, in addition to telling your friends, is switch, try this experiment. Switch to 100% organic if you can do it, 100% for a few weeks. You know, you did. You said in a month things changed for you. So maybe let's go for a month here and have a journal. And when you journal, not just what you eat, but journal your energy level, journal your mood, whether you have anxiety or depression, journal the symptoms, every single symptom and rate it one to 10 and see what happens in your life. And that could be the information that you need to become completely confident that this is the way you want to live your life.
Now, the the non-GMO and organic diet will not cure every disease. It will not cure every autistic child. As one of the um, doctors, the pediatrician in our in our film says, autism is curable, but it depends where on the spectrum it is, and sometimes it's just diet that can do it, but sometimes it's not. So it's certainly going to add to any other type of healing modality that you're doing. And even if you aren't sick, I remember the number two most common response that the audiences, as well as in the survey, is increased energy and also reduced brain fog. So quality of life. And the number three is easier to lose weight. So even if you are feeling healthy and you're eating a chemical-based diet, See what life can be like on an organic diet. Take notes, and when you come to conclusions, share. Share with others, and you will have uh, you'll have people as I do coming up to you saying, "You saved my life." Absolutely, you're reducing your toxic load. If anything, you're reducing your toxic load, so you're you're preventing diseases from happening in the future, and also just helping your body uh, function better. And a better functioning body leads to, like you said, more mental clarity, more energy. Thank you so much for coming on the show today. You are welcome back on the show. Anytime uh, you have a book or a movie to promote, when, when when Secret Ingredients is is ready to launch, I definitely want you to come back. We, we need to share this episode. Please share this episode with everyone you know and love. Uh, let's go to uh, secretingredientsmovie.com. Please donate what you can so that... Um, we can have this movie be finished. Um, you know, I know Jeffrey, you are doing so much in this arena. And, uh, and so we need to, if we want to watch this movie, <laughs> we need to support it. And also uh, please go to responsible technology.org. Um, if you are moved by this, become a, go to the take action tab, become a GMO speaker and, uh, and, and get an action toolkit and start uh, helping uh, your community understand why this is important. Uh, go to the donate tab donate what you can i think every dollar matters because what you're doing is is helping save humanity and uh, and i don't think you're doing anything less other than helping save humanity all the links to everything that jeffrey smith does is going to be in the show notes of today's podcast so you can reach them there at learntruehealth.com thank you so much jeffrey it has been so eye-opening so inspiring i am i i just want to go out there and start you know yelling at people non-gmo so th <laughs> thank you thank you so much and and um, like I said, please come back on the show. Let's keep this conversation going. Um, I'd love to have you back uh, several times. And, 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 and I see years in the future, you come back on and, and you get to say, we won the fight. I, I'm, I'm looking forward to the day that you come back and say, look, we won the fight. We've gotten rid of GMOs. You know, organic is on the rise. We're, we're helping heal the world. Um, that, that's, my, that's my goal with this podcast is, is helping to save humanity. So I'm right there with you. Thank you so Be much. Beautiful. Thank you, Ashley, and everyone safe eating. Enjoy what you heard today on your episode of the Learn to Health podcast. Did something move you, inspire you? Did you get great information that's going to change your life? Awesome. That's exactly what I'm here to do is to help you gain your health back. Please turn around and share this. If this is something that's helped you in any way, share this with those you love. Love the Learn True Health podcast and want to support us? Awesome. You can go to takeyoursupplements.com and you can support us that way. You'll get access to amazing supplements that are just really great quality for a great price. And there'll be someone on the other end of the line to help you pick out your supplements that are right for you. That's takeyoursupplements.com or join our membership, learntruehealth.com slash join. That's another great way to support our podcast, support our movement, and you'll be supporting yourself. Gain more information, wonderful videos, wonderful trainings, and you'll also be able to share those with those you love as well. So go to learntruehealth.com slash join. Want something fun for free? Go to learntruehealth.com and right there on the front page, you'll see where you can get our free cookbook. I spent a lot of time making it and it was so much fun. It's really delicious, healthy recipes. And you can also get our seven day doctor course uh, right there. It's seven days of naturopathic videos sent right to your inbox and you can learn from top naturopaths on how to gain health naturally. So that's takeyoursupplements.com for one wonderful supplements learnyourhealth.com slash join to join our awesome membership which is only open for a limited time 
You can get our free healthy cookbook and you can also get for free seven days of wonderful naturopathic videos sent to you. Just go to learntruehealth.com and you'll see it right there on the front page. Thank you so much for being a listener and thank you for sharing and helping others. Let's spread this information and turn this ripple into a tidal wave. 